All right, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I want to welcome everyone this morning as we get ready to enter into a quiet time of prayer and reflection to prepare our hearts for worship this morning. Our New Testament reading is found in Acts chapter 4, starting at verse 32 through 35. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it to the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who was in need. Our other reading in the New Testament is in John chapter 20. And it reads, starting at verse 19, On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, the door was locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said this, and he showed them his hands and said, his hands aside, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me, and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let us take a few moments and prepare our hearts for worship this morning.
Isn't that great? You guys got a little extra music this morning because I didn't know that my cue is to come up here. So she, poor Kathy just kept playing. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I wanted to welcome you uh, to the Chandler Cumberland Presbyterian Church this morning. Um, it's a beautiful morning. Um, are there any announcements? Awesome, I got it easy. Great, no announcements. Okay, uh, at this point in time, uh, we would like to invoke the Holy Spirit to come into our church so that we can worship, and uh, we'll bring in the light, and then afterwards we'll sing a song. You know what, I think I'll pray. That sounds like a good idea. Um, Could you bow your heads with me, please? Dear Lord, we thank you so much for getting us through this week. Thank you for helping all of us with our, the difficulties that we encounter on a daily basis at our jobs and in our lives. And please be with those who we've been worried about and who those, all the stresses that we're carrying within our hearts. Please be with our Sunday school teachers today uh, so that you may speak through them. And we also ask that you be through our pastor so you he can deliver a message that's your message to us. We thank you very much, Lord. Amen. You can stand, and we'll sing at the cross. It's on page 188. First, second, and fourth verse. and did my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love be at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day but drops of grief can never repay the debt of Now is the point in time where we worship God through our tithes and offerings. Our offertory scripture is from Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship.
All rise. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for giving us the strength and the wisdom and the knowledge to be able to work so that we're able to get a, a blessing from you that we can now give back to you. And please use these tithes and offerings for your will and your will only. Amen. All right, good morning. morning. Now comes the time of our praises and concern. Who would like to begin? Yeah, praise God that took care of us. Yep. Um, real quick, Bob, on Sylvia, why did you say that she was debating on whether or not to have corneal, corneal surgery. surgery? Okay. All right. Uh, keep uh, Sylvia in prayers as she's debating on whether or not to have corneal surgery. Uh, also, uh, pray for Bob's Aunt Sue. Uh, she fell and broke her hip, so we pray for recovery and healing in there. Uh, we also want to pray for Bob's niece, Robin. Uh, she has fatigue and has been falling, and so we just want to lift them up in prayers, knowing that God is working, God is there, and God can heal. Anything else this morning? Awesome. Well, we're glad to have you here. So. Congratulations. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I wanted to say a prayer for an organization that helped our church out a lot. They were called Feline Fix. They're still hopefully together. Uh, they were hit by the storms and uh, they lost a vehicle. They lost all of their traps and they lost a, around a thousand dollars worth of vaccines. Um, when we were trying to help Miss Westbrook, uh, one of the things that we needed to do was we needed to rescue these, these cats. And that was an extremely difficult thing. And this organization, they only, they're so poor, they only have a Facebook page. They don't even have a, a, a website. They're all volunteer totally. But these people came out and got these cats for us and didn't charge us a dime and got them all fixed and gave them vaccines and so on and so forth. So if you know anybody that has 
problems with feral cats running around on your property and they're a nuisance, you know, they spread disease and they can cause a lot of damage and so on and so forth. You can get a hold of these people and they will come as long as they get the permission, they'll come to your place, they'll trap those cats and they'll take care of them for you and they don't charge at all. And then re-release them or they try and find farmers that have barns that are infested with like mice and rats and they end up giving it to the farmers so that the f they can take care of those type of rodents for them. So, but anyway, they they uh, they really could use some help um, right now. So I just wanted to kind of mention them because they worked so hard to help us out back when that happened, and it was it took a huge burden off of my heart. Hey, that's a joy. That's one was good. There's, that's um, awesome. I work with a nurse. Um, her name is Deb uh, Steckenthal. Uh, but she needs some, uh, she needs a lot of prayer right now. She's um, been battling some health issues. Uh, she hasn't been able to um, be at work for a while now. And the um, surgery and exam is just not fun. So um, just be praying for her recovery. Awesome. Awesome. Anything else this morning? I want to thank Brother oh. Bobby for the text that I sent him to his Facebook message or phone call. He said he was still on the phone after the tornado hit the Florida Marsh in mm -hmm. Sanford County. And uh, Bobby said, well, I didn't have time to get so fast and run them all. But uh, if y'all want to hear that sound, you know where it's coming. Uh, we were lucky. I will say on that on that first one getting Bob, uh, Stephanie runs in the room that morning and goes, "What are you doing?" And I'm like, "Getting up." And she goes, "Get in the basement." Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, little brother Josh's birthday. <laughs> I'm going to text him about, hey, little brother, it's your birthday. I heard it's your little, yeah, that's funny. Anything else this morning?
Is there anything else this morning? If not, let us go to the Lord in prayer today. Dear God, we come before you right now and want to thank you and praise you. God, we always give you thanks because in all things, you are worth the thanks. Because you are the one that can heal. You are the one that can comfort. You are the one that can surround us and care us in times. You are the fortress we can run to. God, you are mighty and you are powerful. We thank you, Jesus, for enabling us to live this life in such a way that we are in a win-win situation. That we can have hope even when we're given hopeless news and bad news, God. We know that we can find light in you. God, we pray for those who are struggling today, those who are sick, those who need healing. We praise you for the joys, even the ones considered small joys. I don't believe in such a thing because they're big as well, because, God, they're just other proofs. They're just other you speaking to us and touching our lives, and we praise you for that. God, we pray for you this, we pray this morning for those that are in the hospital, that are struggling right now. God, we pray that you would just be with them. Give them comfort and strength. God, we pray for you for the community of Poseyville and Mount Vernon, God, who have lost some loved ones. And God, we pray that you would give them comfort and healing this day. God, we come before you now, lifting all these things up, knowing that you're working and you're moving. And God, there is power in prayer. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Father, be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand, and we'll continue to sing worship today.
God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is a lamb, the lamb for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chain. You know, we, this past week we celebrated Easter, we celebrated uh, Palm Sunday before that, we talked about here's the king, he steps into Jerusalem, the people rejoiced because they saw who he was, but then their eyes started to realize who he exactly was, and they turned from him, they turned against him, but then even though yet we were his enemies, he still died for us. And then he showed us proof of his power by his resurrection. But the most beautiful part about this whole Christian story is that it continues to go on and we await for his second coming. That one day when he becomes or when he returns, that he is king over all things. He is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. And he's here to make all things right, to bring justice to those who have had many injustices against them. We no longer have to worry about our bodies failing and those who are hurting. The things that go on and there's this weird yearning that we should have. This impatience in our prayer saying, Lord, come soon. We await you. That despite everything that goes on and how enjoyable life is, that we still also know that there is something greater beyond this now. This is what we look forward to. This is why we continue to preach and proclaim the gospel. This is why we continue to share our joy and our peace and our hope and our love with other people. As we sing this next song, let this be a prayer as much as it is worship.
flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be. Struck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath, and living water. Such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Father God, we come to you now. We ask that as you get ready to break your bread with us, Lord, that you will remind us of how faithful your promises are, that you go before us, that you set tables in the presence of our enemies, that you lead us beside quiet waters that lay us in the calmest and the greenest of grasses. Father, you care for us. As we await, help us to share with others how much it is that you care for each and every one of us in our communities. Be with Joe now as he speaks your life into us. Amen. All right, good morning. Good morning. Let's get ready to go. Uh, there's something that's kind of happening tomorrow. Probably should be on a prayer request. Uh, we're having an eclipse tomorrow. Is everyone excited about that? Got your glasses? Yeah. So, so um, 
So I'm not one of these preachers that come up and make predictions, but I have a prediction tomorrow. That when the eclipse happens, here's my prediction. Are you ready for this? At that exact time, I will throw out a fishing line. <laughs> and at that moment, I will catch a 14-pound bass. That, that, <laughs> that is my prediction. So come back next week, and I'll tell you if I'm right or not. Huh? You're gonna hold your breath? Yeah, yeah. Oof. But anyways, uh, <laughs> but no, seriously, though, just be safe tomorrow as that comes to town. And uh, the only pastoral thing is I'm always learning. A lot of people, when things like this happen, people manipulate and they come in and, oh, this is a sign, and they go into that stuff. Be very leery about that uh, because the clips happen like two to four times, <laughs> or two happens every two to four years all over the world, just at different locations. So uh, just be leery about that. Um, I want to say that this morning. But as we begin today, I need to ask someone a very important question. Marty Hom, I got a question for you. Yeah, are you, are you ready for the question? When you go camping, because camping season's right around the corner, when you go camping, what, do you, what are all the stuff you have to do to get ready? So what you're telling me is you just don't wait till the day of, you kind of, there's a process to go through, right? Yeah, sure. So it's not just you get up one day, you know what, today I'm going to go camping and you just go. Like, like there's a process that you go through to get everything ready. What's the very first thing that you do to get ready? What's the very first thing to go, you know what, I'm going to go camping. What's the very first thing you do? Make a list? I think there's something before that. Say what? A reservation? <laughs> That's a good one. Before that, <laughs> registration. Man, you guys keep going on this. Really keep going. Before that, the very first thing. Talk. To <laughs> I didn't understand that until uh, about a year and a half ago. <laughs> well, there's something over here. Choose where to go. Before that. Before that. I'm <laughs> getting closer. The very first thing that you do when you decide you're going to go camping, you ready for this, is you actually decide to go. That's the very first step. Before you do anything, the very first thing you do is you decide to go. And oftentimes, when we think about, before we go, when you think about having to get ready, um, a lot of times when you go do something, it's not just you can pick up and go. There's a lot of things that we, gotta, we think we got to get prepared, we got to get ready, get out of bed, get the registration, get the vehicles ready, get the camper loaded down, get the batteries charged, <laughs> plug up the holes in the boat, whatever it may be. <laughs> you got all these different things that we go, oh, man, and sometimes when we think about all these different Oh, there's a lot of work with that. Sometimes we go, it's really not worth it. I don't want to do all that work. See, I am 100% convinced that there is not a Christian in this building today who goes, you know what? They would not be upset if somebody got saved. If somebody got saved today, you would be super excited about it, right? You'd be like, oh, that is so awesome. That is great. Nobody in here would argue, oh, that's a bad, <laughs> nobody would argue, oh, uh, right? You'd be okay with it. But here's where we get kind of, this is where we get kind of freaked out. We're okay when people get saved, but what freaks us out is when we go, God, help me go reach someone for you. It's called evangelism. We're okay with people getting saved. What we struggle with is actually sharing our faith. See, oftentimes when we think about sharing our faith, we think about all the checklists that we need to have down and all the stuff we got to have ready to get ready to go and actually share our faith, that oftentimes we go, ah, it's just too much. 
But if you really want to do something, you will do it, right? That's how it works with evangelism. See, oftentimes, some of the things that we come up with when it comes to sharing our faith is, oh, well, right now, Christianity is not the number one hot topic like everyone's looking for. It's not like going, hey, try this new food. It's not that comfortable. Christianity is kind of this awkward, if you want to know how awkward it is, <laughs> go to a coffee shop, go to a restaurant, just stand up and go, hey, does anybody love Jesus? Would anybody do that? <laughs> Why not? Because it is awkward. In fact, someone might be like, just stand up saying something a bit awkward, right? Well, think about this for a moment. One time, I went to Starbucks, and it was in my younger years, and I was at Starbucks when I thought it was cool, and I had a hat on there, and it had, it had something that looked like the Starbucks logo, but it was actually a Jesus hat. And I walked up there, the coffee person, uh, I, I, I don't know, barista? See, I had to be careful because I keep saying Batista, and that's a wrestler, so... But I walked up there, and I went up there, and, and the barista went and looked at me and goes, oh, that's a Starbucks hat. And they looked at it deeper, and they're like, oh, that's not a Starbucks hat. I'm like, no, it's not, isn't it? I'm like, no, no, no. You know what I love about it? And they're like, well, they're, like the barista starts working. I go, what? I go, it combines two things I love. I love coffee, and I love Jesus. And I said it just like that. And then I looked around. Like when I was waiting for my coffee, I looked around, and the place was super loud. When I walked in, it was silent. Because it turns out I don't have a volume control when I'm excited. <laughs> it was super silent because there's something awkward about the message of Jesus in the world today. And with all the stuff that's going on, the political climate, and all the climate that we're in today, it's kind of this awkward thing of having to navigate and how to do it and the ways to do it because we got to find this way to stand on truth, but also share the love of Jesus and the message of the gospel at the same time. And it can be a very hard thing to navigate, very hard thing to do. And with all these different things, we might go, oh, it's just too hard to navigate. Might as well not even do it. It's sometimes what we start thinking. We might not think that or say that, but often that's what our actions do. Another thing, excuse that we give ourselves to why we don't evangelize is this. Well, I just don't know enough. What happens if they ask me a question that I don't know? What if I don't know the answer to that? What do I do? I'll ask Roman. Roman, you ever been asked a question that you're like, I really don't know the answer to that? Yes. I'm surprised you said yes to that. Yeah. <laughs> but no, yeah, like, you've been asked a question. Did you make up something? No. You're, you'd be like, that's a... That's a good question. I'll have to look into that. I never thought of that before. I was like, you know what? I can't recall that. I'll have to look into it. Well, anyways, oftentimes we think we have to be able to know the Bible inside and out, upside and down, to be able to go out and share Jesus Christ with people. But oftentimes we go, oh, man, well, what if they, what if they ask me a question that I don't know the answer to? You know what? It's okay. It's really okay because it's really okay to be in that situation. Because at that point, that means they're really engaged in what you have to say. It means that they want to know what you have to say, and that's a good thing. Well, what do we do? Here's what's going to happen. In the next few weeks, we're going on a journey called the Romans Road. And what this is going to do is going to go over a passage of scriptures that was used to, you used to get a gospel track called the Romans Road, and people would give them out all the time. Go here, here, here. Well, instead of going out and giving gospel tracts, we're going to memorize some verses. So that way, when we're having conversation with people and actually talking about Jesus and actually going through that process, we'll actually have some stuff that we're able to talk about and to go through and to know the gospel message and to be able to articulate it. Because I think the hardest part is knowing how to articulate the faith in such a way that it produces fruit. And that's what we're going to dive into. Who's excited and who's ready? Everyone's like, I'm excited, but I'm a little bit nervous because we all know what's happening. Because when we go through this, that means we're all going to be having some awkward spiritual conversations with people. And let me tell you, it gets awkward. If you go right now on Facebook, right now, and you type in my name and you look at some of the posts I posted, there's this one where I posted about how a guy, a preacher was going on, and he talked about how there's 63 
thousand connections between the Old Testament and New Testament, how it connects together. And if you read the comments, that's where it gets interesting. A guy commented on my post, who just happens to be my cousin, and he starts going, and he creates an argument, and he shares this website that always likes to share with me, and he start, brings up that website again, and I respond back and, have, and open up a dialogue and explain why I don't believe that this website's correct. He doesn't answer back. <laughs> he's, a Facebook, he's one of those Facebook heroes. He'll just say something and try to... You know, anyways, having these kind of conversations is going to happen. You're going to have people who are going to come up and attack and attack and attack who are really good at arguing, but what we're going to do is we're going to help create a foundation of knowing what the gospel message is, being able to articulate and bring it forth. So we're going to go ahead and we have to make a decision today, which is this. Are we going to go and evangelize? Are we going to go and share our faith? That's the very first step. Because once you make that decision, yeah, I'm going to go camping, you start putting in the work and the effort and the knowledge and the know-how to actually go and go camping or to go and go fishing. And there's a lot to do. You know what I spent about eight hours, six to eight hours doing yesterday? I cleaned two rails the entire day. That's all I did pretty much. Cleaned two rails. And I'm not happy about it because I thought it was going to take two hours. Took all day. When you decide to go do something, you'll put in the work to get better at evangelizing, to know more about the Bible, and to be able to share your faith. Does that make sense where I'm going? We're going to go with the number one stop today in Acts chapter 2. And this ain't part of the Romans Road. This is kind of the intro to the Romans Road that we'll start next week. So we're going to start reading in chapter 2, verse 1. And this is... One of the coolest things that happens in Scripture, because guess what the, disciples, the apostles receive at this moment? Anybody know this story in Acts chapter 2? This is, yeah, they receive the Holy Spirit. This is, if you go back, uh, especially in Luke, and especially in other, th- in other passages of Scripture, um, in the New Testament, especially in the Gospel, it talks about, I'm going to give you this wonderful counselor. Something's going to come. Something's going to happen. Something's going to take my place. Something's going to come in here that I'm going to be with you forever. I'm going to have this counselor, this helper. You're going to receive some type of spirit. And the disciples go, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that is. But if they knew they were going to get it, they just didn't know what they were about to get and about to receive. And so what happens is about 40 days, Jesus, after his resurrection, Jesus was on earth. He went around appearing to people. He appeared to over 500 people. People saw the resurrected Jesus walking, moving, preaching, teaching, doing things. That Jesus was resurrected. And he was going around for 40 days. And then in Acts chapter 1, he ascends. He ascends up into heaven. And all the apostles are looking up. An angel appears. Hey, why are you looking up? Don't you know <laughs> that they're going to receive the Holy Spirit? Reminds them of the Holy Spirit like they... They're reminded that they're supposed to receive the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden, Acts chapter 2 takes place. And why is receiving the Holy Spirit important? And that's what we're going to answer this morning. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house they were sitting They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. I want to stop right there for a moment. So it was the day of Pentecost and they have all gathered together and they were with one another and they were in one place. And and here's the thing that I think is really awesome. They were in one place together. (laughs) Let me say it again. They were in one place together, worshiping the Lord, and then something happened. They were together, and then suddenly a sound like a blowing or a violent wind came from heaven. And can you imagine? Have you accidentally turned on a high-powered fan in front of a bunch of papers? (laughs) Like, I imagine in my head, they're sitting around, and this huge wind comes, and everything gets scattered around that this wind comes in, because it doesn't just say, oh, this is kind of windy. No, a violent wind came from heaven and filled the house they were sitting, and then tongues of fire well, it came upon each of them and rested upon them, and it filled them. Now, 
when, here's the question, when do we, as believers of Christ, receive the Holy Spirit? Do you even know we receive the Holy Spirit? Does anybody know? Anybody want to answer? Afraid? We receive the Holy Spirit upon the moment of salvation. And what's real fun is we're receiving, and oftentimes we're receiving. Some people are aware of it. Some people aren't. Some people go for a while, and then all of a sudden they have a weird encounter. They're like, what was that just happening? I'll never forget. So when I got saved, I knew I was saved. I didn't quite understand what was going on in my life and the changes that were taking place because when you get saved, it changes you in all ways. Let me say that first of all, that when you get saved, the way you think, the way you act, everything about you starts to change. Some is slow, some is faster. We all, we all change at different rates, but something inside of us changes. And we look different. Everything about us starts to be different and move because why? Because we're being filled. Let me tell you something right now. Do not do this, children. Do not do this. But I guarantee you that if you stuck your hand in a flame, you would get what? Burned. If the Holy Spirit fills you, I guess what? You're going to get <laughs> filled. Thank you. That whenever you're touched by the Holy Spirit, you don't stay the same. This change takes place and it's exciting. And especially when you start, when you're able to start recognizing it and start able to do things and say things and be in places, things start happening. The very first time, you know when the very first time I recognized the Holy Spirit was? In the middle of a fist fight in high school. Yeah, in the middle of a fist fight in high school. Back then, before you guys got the nice, calm Joe, I had an attitude problem, and I was a very angry person. And we were in high school, and when I was a sophomore, junior in high school, somewhere around there, I got saved. And I started pursuing my walk with Christ, and God started to change me and working in my life, and my demeanor was changing to be more like Jesus. And whenever I say that I'm not as like angry, what I mean is, is that I'm not as violent as I was back then. Now, let me tell you something. That doesn't mean weak. Oftentimes, people think, well, if you're big and tough and scrappy, that means you're strong. No, 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 no. Being a follower of Christ, <laughs> you can't be a follower of Christ and become weak. Let me just put it to you that way. Anyways, and we were sitting there, and it was in PE one day, and the youth kids, if they're here, they'll well, they've heard the story, and you might have heard the story too, but I was in PE one day, and me and this guy, and, and we got kind of violent on the line of scrimmage, like we're playing football, and basically, uh, he comes in to try to rush the quarterback, and he was doing this weird thing, like, he, I don't know what he was doing, I call it the ostrich move, you know what the ostrich move is in football? It's whenever you try to rush the quarterback, but for some reason, you try to take your head to the ground. Anybody ever seen anybody do that? So do you know what happens when someone does the ostrich move? Do you know what the number one way to kind of use against that? It's this. You step to the side, and you just kind of push down to their back, and they face plant. Guess what I did? I stepped to the side, the guy face planted, our quarterback was safe, and we were like, yeah. Except he wasn't happy. He was mad. And all of a sudden, all, the, all my friends there, they're like, Joe, you really made him mad. Maybe you should, like, not face off against him on the line anymore. I'm like, whatever. And so I went to the other side of the line. He was on the other side of the line. The play gets over, gets done with. And all of a sudden, I turn around, and guess what I see at the last second? His fist in my face. Bam. I didn't go down. It's a bragging moment. But he hits me right in the face. And at that moment, my friends come, and they're like, do we let Joe fight? They didn't know what to do because I had blood gushing out of my nose. It looked, it was bad. I mean, it, I was covered. And they're like, what do we do? And all of a sudden, I started to go for him, right? That's what you do normally. And if someone hits you, you hit him back, right? And I am angry, and I am in the moment. And this was the first time I ever recognized the Holy Spirit in my life. 
I had a thought. It was like a whisper in my own head, and it stopped me in my tracks. You know what it said? This is what it was, and I'll never forget this to my, to my, <laughs> the rest of my life. This is what it said to my, this is what the Holy Spirit said to me in this moment. It goes, if you hit him, it's as if you hit me. And I stopped, and my friend's mouth just dropped to the ground because I couldn't move. I was more freaked out about where that came from than what actually was going on with me physically. At that moment, something, I knew something had changed in me. Because the old Joe, we both would have went to the <laughs> we both would have been to the principal's office and both expelled. Something changed. See, when the Holy Spirit comes and it fills your life, it changes you to that degree. To where you might not respond like you used to, because why? The Holy Spirit is working in you. It's speaking to you. It's what God uses to help you, guide you. It fills you up and enable you to do the things that God has called you to do. See, oftentimes, what scares us about evangelizing and going out and sharing our faith, and I'm not talking about being like crazy, like crazy going out and sharing your faith and being like, you know, you know the type of people I'm talking about when I say that. I'm talking about in your circle of influence, the people you come into, you can share your faith in two ways, but they must be done in two ways. Because here's what happens. One is, do you know you can share your faith without even speaking a word? But here's what happens. At some point, you got to use your words. Your actions will speak loud. It will earn you the right to speak the gospel in someone's life. Oftentimes, we are really good at sharing the gospel with our actions, but we're not very good at sharing the gospel with our words. And here's the thing. Our actions are great, and it's awesome, but if we never, if we never ever take the opportunity to share our faith, they, can't get, they don't get saved. <laughs> That might be the it before their next breath. See, oftentimes we don't realize what's on the line. We might think well, we have tomorrow, but we might not have tomorrow. They might not have tomorrow. We don't know. So we love on people with an opportunity to share Jesus with them. And here's what happens. We're often scared to share our faith because we just might be like, I don't know what's going to happen. But here's the thing. You don't go alone. Here's what happens to the, the disciples. The fire came upon them and filled them. Here's what happens. When the fire ignited them, it just didn't ignite them. It ignited their mouth in order to proclaim the gospel. When the fire descended upon them, it came out of their mouth. Do you know what's so exciting about young believers? And I'm not talking about age. I'm talking about new Christians, okay? Do you know what's so exciting about it? They are excited for the word. They are excited for Jesus. They are just excited. I need to ask someone permission for something. Roman, can I share something about your brother? Okay. Roman's brother, who played the drums at our Easter service, which did an awesome job, great, great guy. He had this head-on collision with Jesus on a tractor or something like that, and all of a sudden, he has got ignited and on fire for the Lord. And I promise you, here's what happened. We're playing video games. Me and Roman, I know, video games, adults, what? It happens. <laughs> Welcome to 2024. We're playing games together, we're not. And me and Roman, we're trying to play the game. Do you know what his brother's doing? He's trying to talk about Jesus. And I realize this. You know what? He's not doing very good. He's probably the worst player on the team, but he's the one in that lobby who's most excited about Jesus. And that's a powerful statement right there. And you could tell him I said that. That was awesome. Because when we get saved, when the Holy Spirit fills us, it makes us excited. And oftentimes, when as Christians, as we go forward, we forget about that moment, and we kind of, we don't lose our excitement, but our excitement becomes duller. That's the nice way of point, putting it. Our excitement becomes a little bit less than what it used to be. Like we, we kind of lose this thing, and here's what I think happens. Here's what, I, here's what I ultimately think happens. That when we don't 
see people get help or saved in the name of Jesus, we lose our excitement. Here's something I remember in high school. There was a young man, and I might have told you the story, but I love the story. It's a very powerful story because it's part of my testimony. There was a young man, and he started coming to our Bible study. And after Bible study at the school, I had to take him to meet his mom. And we went there, and one night he came up there, and we were in the back of the car, and on the way there, he started asking questions about how to be saved. He had heard enough of the gospel that he knew that he wanted the promise of Jesus. He knew he wanted it. He knew he wanted to have that, but he just didn't know how. He didn't know what the next step was. And so me and my friend in this old rust bucket, it was a 19... 89 Chevy Celebrity or something around there. It was an old car. Like, literally, I washed it one time and I had to get a new car. <laughs> That's how old this car was. This young man in the back seat of the car asked Jesus Christ to be his Lord and Savior. He was excited. He went home. Me and my friend, little Joe, we looked at each other, and right then and there, we knew what God's plan and calling was for in our life. We knew right then and there that we want to see more people get saved. Because we saw the change in this young man. Here's what we did. We got in our car, we drove 15 miles to our country church out in the middle of nowhere. It was called Hidalgo Independent Christian Church at the time. We went into this church. We interrupted their prayer meeting, their Tuesday night prayer meeting. We busted through the doors and we were like, we stopped the prayer meeting and we went like this and we go, guys, we have a praise. And they're all like, what? Like, there's, you guys are too high strung right now. We go, well, someone just got saved in the back seat of my car. Super excited. Do you know what they kind of did? Oh, that's nice. <laughs> and I'll never forget that. Me and little Joe walked away going, why aren't they excited as we are? Because there's something exciting that when God uses you, what it does is it stokes the fire when you see change happens. Let me tell you something. If you feel like your faith is dead, like it's kind of just plain, doesn't have any spice or ingredients in it, let me tell you something. Share Jesus. Someone gets saved. And let me tell you what, you will be hooked for life. True story. They were ignited to speak, and they spoke. And in the Bible, it says other tongues, but it was other languages. Verse 5, now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hear them in our own native languages? The Parthians, the Medes, and the Elamites, the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pont Pontus, and Asia, Phygra, and Pamphyla, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? That when the Holy Spirit came into their lives, in this moment, when the Holy Spirit came in and they started speaking in other languages, people started hearing and some type of supernatural event was taking place. And I want to share something with you because this is going to freak you out. That when you evangelize, it is a supernatural experience every single time. You ever thought of it that way before? I haven't. But I keep thinking about it, and it totally is. Have you ever, anybody in here ever did door-to-door -door evangelism before? It's where you go up to someone's door, knock on it, and share Jesus? Roman has? Yeah. Let me tell you. I have, I've held sharks in my hand. I've held snakes in my hand. I have petted alligators. I have done all kinds of crazy stuff that I should have been terrified of. You know what, you know what my greatest fear is? 
walking up to someone's door, knocking on it with the intentions to lead a conversation that gets to share Jesus with them. That is the scariest thing a person can do. And I don't know why. It is a supernatural fear that comes along. I remember uh, earlier on, my early years as a youth minister, uh, I took Beth in a youth group. We went to this, uh, there used to be the thing called Dare to Share, which is an evangelism training conference. And we would go there, and used to they would go to the neighborhoods and you collect canned food goods and ask for prayer requests, and then which leads into sharing Jesus if the door opens. And oftentimes I did, but the thing that was even worse than that was going to the mall and talking to people just in their everyday lives if they were willing to talk. And I still think it's amazing. Do you know who, you know who the people were that were willing to talk to us about Jesus? Non-Christians. All the Christians were too busy to talk, but the non-Christians would actually want to engage and actually take it up. And I'm telling you what, it was the scariest thing ever. We would sit there, and all of a sudden, and you got to remember, not only are we going to talk to people in the mall, we're also, I'm an introvert. Do you know what that means? Introverts are people who don't like to be, they're not the ones going up to people, hey, how's it going? They're not the woos of this world. Introverts, they like to be at home, sitting on the couch, reading a book or watching TV or out like by themselves. They don't like to go out there and do that. I'm an introvert. It's not my natural gifting. It's not my natural thing to do. It's to go up and start a conversation in case you haven't noticed. And yet, where has God placed me? In the one place that I should be an extrovert, in the one place where I'm speaking, not in front of just one person, but a bunch of people. Look at what God, like me being up here is not a natural thing. It's a God thing. I remember walking up there, and we broke up into our little groups. We had adults with teenagers going up to talk to people about Jesus. And I was the adult in my group, obviously, because I was the youth minister. And we were sitting there, and all of a sudden, the kids froze in mid-conversation to this person. And I realized that I was going to have to set the stage to show how it's done. And I, if I could tell you what, my heart rate was about 5,000 at that moment. I went up there, my voice was caught in my throat, and I was scared to death. I was like, I can't do this. And that's all I could think was, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. And right before I actually engaged the conversation, I said, God, help me. <laughs> that's all I could say. And all of a sudden, I went up there, and it looked like I knew what I was doing. Outside, I was calm and confident and able to share Jesus with them. We had an awesome conversation that led to prayer, which led to them thinking about getting back in the church. It was awesome. All the youth kids were like, wow, that was awesome. And I said, you know why it was awesome? And they're like, yeah, because you did a great job. And I said, no, that was Jesus because I was freaking out on the inside. And I'm like, you were freaking out. I'm like, yeah. And they're like, we were too. And then they all, guess what? They went and started sharing Jesus with people. It's an awesome thing because here's, here's the thing. People, there's a supernatural event that takes place. Evangelism is something that God is working with. He's working in our hearts. He's working in their hearts. God is working in the hearts of people. And even with all this, and, and here's something I want to tell you. Here is the key. If you want to know where it starts at evangelism, it's deciding to do it. But here's the thing that you need to know. Yes, you might decide to do it. But guess what empowers you to do it? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit ignites your little voice box and gives you the strength and gives you the words and leads you and guides you through the fear to share your faith. And here's, I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes you'll have an awesome experience like the one I told you about. And other times you're going to have a horrible experience going, that wasn't very great, because here's the deal. Our jobs are not to create an outcome. Our jobs is to go do it and leave the outcome up to God. And here's what happens. You would think that when these guys start preaching the gospel, you would think that everybody would be like, that's awesome, and this is great, and it's all a win-win story. But listen to this. Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. They're just drunks. They're just crazy. 
And, I'll, and I'm, I think I'm going to go ahead and end on this this morning. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. And he goes off to preach the message. Here's the thing. There is one, there is a universal truth in this church that we all know and agree with. And you know what that is? That I'm crazy. Here's the deal. People are going to look at you and think you're going to be crazy. I'd rather be known as being crazy for Jesus than anything else in this world. If I'm going to be called crazy, it might well be crazy for Jesus. Amen? Let us pray. And as we dive in, we're going to take a look at how to share our faith, what words to actually say, and by the end of this journey... You'll be powered and equipped to actually share our faith. Let us pray this morning. Dear God, we come before you right now. We want to thank you for this time of preaching and thank you for this time of your message of diving into your word. God, your Holy Spirit went into the lives of these men, and when they received your spirit, they were empowered. They had a fire raging in them with the gospel message. God, they went out and they boldly proclaimed your word. I pray this morning that your spirit, that we would recognize and feel it because with us who have professed Jesus as Lord and Savior, thus that are saved, we have the Holy Spirit and dwelt within us. We are completely filled and empowered to do all your works. I pray this morning that when we walk from this place, that we would go forth and boldly proclaim your message, boldly proclaim your love, boldly proclaim you to the world around us. Let us not be ashamed for what we take for our faith. Let us not be ashamed what gives us eternal life. Let us not worry about whether or not people think we're crazy. God, let us let people see your love for them through us. Let our actions and our words match where people can fully see you. I pray right now in your spirit. I pray right now that each of us right here today who are wrestling with this thought, wrestling with this question, that today we would stand forth and we would just decide to go share the gospel with that person you've laid on our hearts. That we would go forth from this place and share Jesus with that one person, with that next person. That we would look at every opportunity that this could be the very last time we ever meet. God, help us recognize your voice and your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us stand and worship this morning.
take our failures, you take our weakness, you set your treasures in jars of clay. So take this heart, Lord, I'll be your vessel, the world to see. walk from this place this morning and we go out into the world know that God is with you working in you using you that every time you come into a situation look for those God moments look for those moments where God has empowered you to look at someone else and to share Jesus with them you don't have to know everything you just have to know the Lord Oh, we have communion this morning. Never mind. Sit down. That's right. All right. Here we go. <laughs> Roman's like, we're having communion this morning. Yes, yes, we are. Whew. If I can have, I even set up communion today, and it's like, how did I forget that? If I could have our, the elders that are going to serve communion come forward this morning. Oh, my. <coughs> you know, oftentimes uh, when we come take communion, we take communion about once a month. And one of the things that communion does is it's a reminder. It is a celebration of the gospel message that Jesus was born, that he lived, that he died. He rose again and he's coming back in. It's this promise that we hold on to. It is something that we take for, often take for granted, but it's something that is life-changing. Because when we take communion, it is this intimate moment between me and God and the people I sit next to. It reminds us that our worship, uh, that our walk with Jesus, it isn't just isn't just me and Jesus. It's me, Jesus, and my church family. That the, bio, that the walk with Jesus isn't just something that I take on alone. It's something that we do together. And I tell you now, as we take communion today, that if there is a call for unity and to being together, this is it. We must stand together, love one another, and to be there for each other. Because we are going through things, people in this church and the people that we know are going through things that are life-altering, life-changing, and we need each other. Today, we come here to celebrate, and there's nothing more intimate than having a meal with another person.
day we come here to take communion to receive a meal. It's an intimate moment between Jesus, us, and everyone here this morning. We take communion and we'll pass out the elements and you'll hold on to them and we'll all take together at the end. Let us pray. Dear God, we come before you right now and want to thank you and praise you for this time. We ask now, Jesus, that as we celebrate you and our walk with you, we're reminded of the blood that you spilled, the life that you lived, the example that you've given us. We're reminded of your power by the resurrection and the hope of you coming again. I pray now, Jesus, that as we celebrate you saving us, as we're reminded of the covenant that you've given to us, a promise that is way more than a promise. God, it's something that is sacred. We ask now that you would bless the bread and the juice that we're about to receive. And may we celebrate your loving grace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Dear God, we come before you right now. Thankful that you chose to save us. That God, you could abandon us, you could leave us, you could have done any other thing. But yet instead you loved us. I pray that we would share your love as we go forth from this place. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I've already given my benediction, so we'll go ahead and have the candle lighters come forward. <laughs> 